Are you a leader who hates being blindsided during a meeting by maybe your boss or a peer or somebody from another department or, or another agency altogether? I certainly don't like that. And in this episode, we're going to talk about three things that you can do specifically so that never happens again. I'm Daryl Black. And I take my 30 plus years of crisis leadership, emergency management, and corporate project management. And I help leaders and leaders of leaders move from well-intentioned manager to effective leader because I know that there is a critical path. Ultimately, it's about improving and increasing your impact, your influence, and your income. Here's the problem. If you are not able to convey information, and information in this context is data or status, data or status, then you're not able to do your fundamental jobs as a leader. Those are providing top cover for the team. It's about removing barriers. It's about providing resources. It's about providing said data to the team. You can't do any of those things if you are getting outdated info, if your info is just not getting to you, if you're not able to get it to where it needs to go, all of those other things. And therefore, you'll be frustrated. You'll be going into those meetings and you'll be getting blindsided. I remember an operation that we were involved in or I was involved in supporting. Early on in this operation, we started off with just a couple of us and we grew very, very quickly within, you know, seven days or so to I think a couple hundred people, five sites geographically dispersed, super, super fast. And I remember being in those first meetings early on and we were working with and for a federal department and actually numerous federal departments that were really, really good at conveying status, specifically bad status. So if there was a site outage or a problem with something, an inability to, to perform a task, that information, that status went up like a rocket. And early on in the operation, we were just building the bus as we were driving it. And, and it was really, really challenging. And I hadn't put all of the structure into place that I'm going to talk about here. I didn't have time. I was doing a whole bunch of other things. And let me rephrase that. I didn't dedicate the time to it early enough. And so as a result, I would be going into meetings and there'd just be myself, little old me. And I would be getting updates from folks from other agencies with regard to what was happening on the team the very team that I supported. And that was a problem because for me, that is a pet peeve. And that is something I've talked to a lot of leaders about and leaders of leaders, and they do not like being blindsided. If there's bad news, then at least tell me so I can prepare for it and I can figure out some, some ways to deal with it, what I'm going to talk about and, and how I'm going to handle it before I go into a meeting. Really, really important. So I recognized that I needed to really implement some changes as quickly as I could. And those changes were based on my experience with the 30 years of flood response, wildfires, and all of those other things. And it's those strategies that if you wait right till the end of this episode, you're going to get three of my real gems, the ones that I think are really, really important to move the yardsticks as far ahead as possible in the shortest amount of time. So why does this happen? Why do we run into trouble with regard to communication, particularly at that strategic level? If you're a leader of leaders in particular, the problems become even exponentially bigger, right? It's problems of scale. So, so why is that? It's a bunch of reasons, but one of which is I think you approach communication tactically. What do I mean by that? What I mean is, is any kind of communication course or, or any kind of discussion we've ever had, it's been around the person to person, that tactical face to face or email or text and whatever else, video. That's where we spend a lot of our time focusing on is my ability as the leader to communicate 
data and status to the individual on my team or my team, my immediate sphere of influence. But when we start to talk about larger projects, when we talk about a distributed workforce, a remote workforce, we really have to think about communication in terms of the conveyance of data and status strategically. We have to think about it at scale and we have to think about it as a framework or a structure or a lot more abstract than normally we would think about that. So before we dive too far into this, it's important to realize that the tactics that we are going to be talking about are all about the reaction and the reality that leadership is all about balance. So what do I mean by that? Well, my personal approach to leadership is very much pushing as much decision-making down as possible to the front lines. That front line could be a bunch of individuals that are filling sandbags, fighting a wildfire, or in the corporate project management experience, my lived experience there, it could be individuals that are doing programming or IT work around systems, or it could be around training on a, on a new process, something like that. I push as much of that down as I possibly can. And We'll circle back to that in a little bit. But I also recognize that by pushing that down, I lose what I call situation awareness. I lose the minute by minute status. I lose my ability to see exactly what's going on. So with that autonomy that is granted, with that respect, with that lack of micromanagement, with that more strategic thinking, that I do on one end, I know that I have to then adjust that because I'm not observing. I'm not as tactically engaged. I'm not in the weeds. So I have to balance that. I have to shore up something else so that I do get that status and that I do get the data from the front lines, quote unquote front lines, but also the front line gets it from me. So it's all about balance and adjustment. And it's that balance and adjustment that we're talking about here. So that the model though, fundamentally is the same, whether it be face-to-face -face or strategic or amongst a project or distributed workforce, you name it. And that is this, we have a sender and we have a receiver and we have a message. Okay, thanks. Not rocket science, right? I would agree. It is not rocket science and yet it's one of the most difficult things we do as leaders. We're familiar with that, but one of the areas that we're not as good at, I would submit to you as leaders and even as human beings, frankly, is another element called feedback. So we have the sender, we have the message, we have the receiver, but there's an element of feedback that is absolutely critical to effective communication, both whether that be on the person to person, but also the more strategic, which is what we're talking about in this episode. So we have to remember that there's the feedback piece that has to be inserted for communication to actually truly happen. The other piece we have to remember is that really there is no such thing as a sender and receiver staying static throughout the entire exchange. And what I mean by that is the sending and the receiving of information. Remember there's the, the message and then there's the feedback. That is a constant dance that is going on. That is a constant interaction, interchanging in real time the sender and the receiver. Because remember, really, essentially, the receiver, by sending feedback, is actually the sender. I know, I know, that's pretty meta. But what we're trying to do is, is take that abstract model and we're trying to apply that to a strategic level so that as leaders, you aren't blindsided during a meeting. So there are some very specific things that we can do. And I'll talk about three of them right now. And we will be spending a lot more time on, on these concepts, but also the more person-to-person -person communication and really deep diving into uh, the conveyance of data and status moving forward in future episodes. And I've also dealt with it in previous ac episodes as well. So one of the things that we have to think about if we are going to solve the problem of being blindsided, if we are going to be making better decisions, if we are going to be less frustrated, if we are going to be able to have the time and the energy to make the bigger decisions so that we're not in the weeds, we have to first and foremost think about who needs to know what. 
Step one, who needs to know what? One of the classic tools, and it's a very great framework to use, is called RACI or a RACI chart. R-A-C-I, RACI. It's one of the first things that I do. And in fact, on this operation, for example, uh, that I was just talking about, that was the very, very first thing uh, my boss had me do. And it was something that uh, I do on an ongoing basis, no matter what situation I'm handling. I may not get to the point where I'm doing it on a spreadsheet or in a fancy chart, but I am absolutely going through the process, the RACI process. Anytime we deploy, anytime I was working on a project, anytime that um, on a search and rescue mission, any type of crisis or anything like that, even in hockey coaching for, uh, for that matter. Yes, that is how strongly I feel about thinking about who needs to know and using the RACI. R is responsible. Who is responsible? That responsibility is ultimately for the task. Who is responsible for performing a particular task or a particular project or something like that, depending on the scale, okay? And the reason you wanted to find that is that individual or those individuals who are responsible, they are going to need different kinds of information than somebody in the other areas of our RACI. And we'll dive into that uh, in a little bit. But essentially, that's what we're talking about when we're doing RACI is thinking about who needs to know what. So R is for who is responsible. A stands for accountable. Who is accountable for this task or this project? Oftentimes, that's you as a leader. Uh, or if you're a leader of leaders, you could be the one responsible for that matter. It all depends on, on where you fit in the organization and how the project or operation is rolling out. But essentially, the person that's accountable is the one who will get in trouble if it's not going really well and probably no credit. But that's just uh, how things work, right? No big deal. So A is who is accountable. They're going to need different information and status than somebody who's responsible, for example. C stands for consulted. Who needs to be consulted? Those are individuals that may not be directly accountable or they may not be um, responsible, but they are individuals that have, they're a stakeholder in your particular operation or your particular team or whatever that is, okay? So R is for responsible, so the task. A is for accountable, who is accountable for making sure this gets done in a timely manner, under budget, on time, so on and so forth. C is consulted. Who needs to be consulted? And I is informed. And informed is just that. Who needs to be told what is going on? And that's typically a status at that level. The informed are often those that are on the CC level of an email, for example. That's a good indicator if they're, uh, if they're informed or not. It's also, politically speaking, a very good idea for you to know the RACI because the last thing you want to be doing is see seeing somebody that actually has some skin in the game and some authority with regard to what's happening. So uh, yeah, you're welcome for that one. So that's using a RACI chart to think about who needs to know what. Because like I said, depending on where you're at, the person that's responsible, they're going to be responsible for the task, but also updating status. Right? So they're sending a status back up to you as a leader. So when I talked about being blindsided, oftentimes somewhere along the line, there has been a breakdown of that status from that person who's responsible up to, to your level, depending on where you're at. If you're accountable, you're going to need to know different pieces of information than say somebody who's informed. The consultation piece, whoever's within that consultative element of RACI, they may not and likely won't need to know the blow by blow of what's happening on the ground. They don't need to know the actual ground truth, the, the tactical kind of situation, unless they ask. So you can see how important it is that if you want to communicate effectively strategically, if you want to avoid a lot of the frustration, figure out who needs to know what using that RACI. The second thing you should do, and the second principle is reduce the amount of communications that are needed. Reduce the amount of comms that are needed. Remember that situation back in school where it was like, um, you know, the game of telephone where there was a kid at the front of the class, typically the teacher whispered something into, into their ear. And then inevitably, 
by the time it got to the end, whether it be like five people or end of 30, that message had nothing to do with that original message, the game of telephone. I am amazed at how much I use that as a reference, honest to goodness. Here I am a grown man and I remember back to elementary school, that exercise. Wow, talk about um, effective teaching there. So you want to really reduce the amount of comms needed because the game of telephone comes into play. And the more information you have, quite frankly, the more that it's likely to get misconveyed or misconstrued or interpreted wrong, whatever term you want to use. So you want to reduce the amount of comms needed and that will also reduce the frequency by which we have to communicate. So that frees you up from meetings and things like that. And we'll talk about that coming up here shortly. So how do you reduce the amount of communication needed? While it's really good in principle, what does it look like in practice? And there's two parts to this. One is the thought that you want to push the authority down as far as you possibly can, as far as you're comfortable and as far as your organization is comfortable. For me, it's right to that front line, if at all possible, the boots on the ground, the individuals filling sandbags, the individuals doing the coding, the individuals that are conducting whatever tactical part of our operation uh, or project. That's where that authority and that's where as much information needs to be pushed and status updates sent down to and brought back up as well. So push that down. Therefore, you don't have to be constantly directing them, boom, 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 how, and, and constantly over their shoulder, communicating, 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 because you have pushed that down, you've empowered them, you're showing them what right looks like with regard to respecting them, giving them their autonomy and therefore confidence and, and knowing that you have faith in their ability to do their job. So then the natural barrier to that is the fact that, well, Daryl, it's going to be anarchy. We're going to have people doing whatever they want because we need to know what's going on. Well, yes and no, because we're going to layer on something that we call intent or leader's intent specifically. I've spoken about it in previous episodes and it involves three elements, the task, so the what, the purpose, the why, and the end state what right looks like. So the what, the why, and the what right looks like. Very, very important. Those are the elements of intent. So what you're doing is you're giving them the task. You're telling them why that task is important and why it needs to be done. And this is the really important part, the end state and what right looks like. That is now your control over what happens. You don't care as much about how they do it you just care about what it looks like when it's done. And that leaves them all sorts of flexibility on the ground. And from a communications area, strategically speaking, there's not a lot of back and forth communication that has to happen. Typically, the only communication that will happen is a status update or a data change. So if there's a change in data, like a delta change, you're gonna communicate that down. And conversely, if there's something that they see on their level, at their end, pointy end of the spear, they're going to convey that back up as well. So that's the second thing. Third is to make sure that really ultimately you need to be specific about what you need and when. Be specific with what you need and when. An example would be for me, something I do often in our sit reps situation report. The idea is to have more of them, therefore they can be shorter because if COVID and the pandemic has shown anything, it has proven that our ability to attend end-to-end, -end, endless, back-to-back, -back, sequential meetings is unparalleled. It's absolutely unparalleled. In fact, impressively so in a depressing kind of way. So be specific with what you want and when you need it. So the sit reps a tangible example would be either every hour in a search and rescue situation that I'm very, very familiar with. A team in the field comes across a patient, a subject. Obviously, uh, there's a lot of information that needs to get conveyed. There's a lot of resourcing that needs to happen. There's a lot of communication that has to happen 
in the background, all sorts of things. And the situation is changing very, very rapidly. If it's a project that's just starting, you're going to want more sit reps because you want to make sure that the ship is sailing through the channel correctly because uh, it can be bouncing off the sides and, and especially early when people are getting their sea legs and when the captain may not be totally uh, familiar with the ship. That was me. You want to be very, very careful and uh, with regard to straying too far off course. So have a lot of sit reps early. Have a lot of sit reps when there's a transition happening. So the operation is either scaling up or it's scaling down, for example, or there's a change in workforce, something like that. Be specific with what you need. And one of the ways you can do it is through a sit rep. For me, we ended up doing uh, a sit rep twice a week on this latest operation. And again, I could tell you stories of every operation and project that I've been on. I'm a huge proponent and advocate of, of sit reps. The Tuesday was with just the immediate core leadership team. That was our ability to do a round table. And it's not a long, you know, ton of discussion. It's not a long diatribes. It's not a, an opportunity for folks to hear themselves you know, speak, all of those other things. It was really the core team's opportunity in a very, in an undisturbed way to convey status and data. So typically I would start from the national level. I would give pieces of information that maybe were impacting the policy or the, you know, the next, what is it looking like over the next week, two weeks, six months, something like that. So I'd impart that into the team. And then we'd go through and we would do regional updates, for example, and that was the immediate core. Very, very useful. And the team knew exactly what kind of information was to be conveyed there. We weren't terribly concerned at that meeting with, uh, you know, what kind of rain gear the front line was using or what kind of rental cars they were getting, anything like that, not our circus, not our monkeys. We just wanted to know some things that would impact the rest of the team, things that I needed to know about and so on and so forth. So we knew going into those meetings exactly what was required and, and how much time we had. And it was a very quick and concise meeting. The second one, the second of two uh, sit reps that we would have, that was on Thursday. And the Thursday meeting was with the core team, but also uh, additional stakeholders. So in this particular case, it could be OH&S or risk management. Uh, it could be legal, privacy, those kinds of other stakeholders. So it's our opportunity as an operational core team to convey status and data to them, our, our extended family, but it's conversely the other way around, an opportunity for them to inject into the core team status and information and so on and so forth. So we would have those twice a week for the duration of our operation. And by all accounts, that was extremely valuable. And in fact, we just did our uh, after action review, our debriefing, our uh, post implementation review, our PIR and surprise, well, not surprisingly, um, rewardingly, I guess, communication was, uh, was, was a very, very important highlight and a very good point from our operation. We had a lot of changes. We had a lot of pressure, just like if we're deploying to a, a flood in uh, Northern uh, Canada, where we got to figure out how many kilometers of berm have been put up. We have to figure out uh, what the water level is at and by when. We needed to know what the weather was like for the both near and distant future. All sorts of things are going on there. But by thinking about communication strategically, by thinking about it from a framework perspective, by thinking about it from a structural perspective, by thinking about it from a, an abstract perspective, I took the being blindsided at meetings, did a complete 180, and I would be showing up at meetings, guns blazing with full updates, and in fact, we really uh, got a lot of street cred and trust because very, very quickly people learned that nobody knew the operation better than I did. And the only way I was able to know about it was because we really shored up that communication piece. So I'd encourage you to do the racy, reduce the amount of communications needed and be specific with what you need and when you need it. If you do those three things as a leader, and in particular, a leader of leader, you will not be blindsided at meetings and you 
we'll be able to demonstrate what right looks like with regard to communication. Thanks for listening.